So there's a particularly flawed idea about media criticism that has gained a lot of popularity recently. It's the idea that we can judge art, quote unquote, objectively. First we had Patrick tell us we're watching movies wrong. Now we have this guy telling us we're critiquing movies wrong. I have the feeling the problem isn't with the critiquers. It's with these two guys. That's right, you guys who turn your brains off and can't accept logic and evidence. And let's be clear, there are plenty of schools of thought on how to critique a story, but all of them are about finding meaning in the work. All use different perspectives. For example, there's new criticism or objectively observing and evaluating a piece of work, which I believe is the school just right as attacking. New criticists believe in form, structure, and the meaning of things by virtue of the motivations of the characters and their plights, also known as their plots, which is what I focus on in my channel. Plots are good, plots are king, but they're not all there is to a story. Only after we have ascertained the plot in its proper execution can we begin to evaluate the quality and piece of the rest of the work. People who think like this don't care for external ideas, author intent, when it was written, or a reader's response. The work speaks for itself, as all art should. The other schools of thought are from bad to ridiculously stupid. For example, there are reader response, feminism, new historicism, psychoanalytical, Marxist, and a bunch of others. Each has a new perspective. But okay, just right thinks the most objective one is doing it wrong. Take it away, just right. A kind of criticism that focuses exclusively on things like plot holes and whether the events of a story make strict logical sense. We don't exclusively focus on plot holes. We focus on all flaws. It's just movies which are popular have a habit of having a lot of holes. They're fundamentally broken on the premise sometimes, as do some video games. Once the plot is free of holes and the characters are behaving the way they should, that is, they are round characters that change throughout a story, then we can focus on the other things. New critics believe the structure and meaning of the text were intimately connected and should not be analyzed separately. In order to bring the focus of literary studies back to analysis of the text, they aim to exclude the reader's response, the author's intention, historical and cultural context, and moralistic bias from their analysis. We are trying to be as objective as possible, so to have an opinion as accurate as possible. That's it. We're not excluding the good, we're just looking toward the faults in the structure first and hoping they don't outweigh the bad. The goal of this criticism is to establish that a piece of art is objectively good or bad. I find this position pretty damaging to film discussions as a whole, so today I'm going to explain all the many reasons there is no such thing as objective criticism. I only need two examples to prove there is such things as objective criticism. The first is I only evaluate the bad. What is good is based on taste. Taste is subjective. You will react to certain media differently than the next person. Objectively, we can say a horror film, if properly rendered on the film to make you scared, will actually do so, even if you, watching, like, for example, The Blair Witch Project, didn't react in fear. Um, who knows, uh, because you're a stoic grandmaster. But we can objectively observe the structure and form of the film as it was designed to elicit the fear response in the general audience by its technique, its content, its audio cues, its color palette, its sense of, of hopelessness, the claustrophobia, the limited uh, shaky cam perspective from the lost footage style camera, all of those things. These are all observable and work well. These are all objective things. These are all facts. Even if I or you or others weren't scared watching it. Instead, of all those qualities that make it an objectively scary film, even though you weren't scared, I focus on what's wrong with the film. What is poor structure? What flaws exist in, for example, the characters? Or how poorly that character is expressed? Does every character get an arc, for example? Are some scenes completely pointless? Do they make sense? Are they contradictive of what came before? Does the plot even have a goal or a point? Are there plot devices which are just throwaways? Is there a middle? Uh, is there a denouement? Etc. I then nonchalantly count up the number of holes and have a general opinion. So if it's really good, the flaws are minor, if few. 
Uh, it's mediocre if the flaws are not minor, or there may be some big ones, or maybe there's just a lot more flaws. Who knows? Now, the other category is horrible. If the flaws are gigantic, they're lore-breaking, there's plot-breaking, they pull me out of the story, uh, you know, the willing suspension to leap, the, the disbelief is totally gone, that would be in the horrible category. This is all based off understanding of genre, of plot progression, plot resolution, climax, denouement, music, sound, and the general gestalt of the experience, what we know that stories are. So I focus only on the bad and tally those up in comparison of what is actually working. Since our reaction to what is good is subjective, but everyone knows what really sucks, apparently except for these two. And for my second example, I have relatively functioning ears and eyes. I might be incorrect. I might be really stupid. You can question my intelligence, but I'm not blind and I'm not deaf. So all I need to do is look at the screen or read the page. With everyone being biased and interpretive to art, I'd rather use the most objective lens possible. I'd rather not listen to interpretive people and thus my evaluations become more objective. They are more accurate, they are more truthful, and ultimately the right perspective to use, the right opinion to have. I'd rather just look at the screen and open my ears and pay attention. I don't need theoretical lenses or multiple perspectives to look at art. In fact, I would prefer no lens, which is as close as one gets when using objective observations. You enter subjectivity the moment you make a qualitative statement about those facts. What's wrong with making a qualitative statement about objective observations? That would then be an objective statement. The idea I'm reacting against is the all too common phrase, this movie is objectively bad, which presents an opinion as a fact. Hey, just right, guess what? Opinions can be based on objective observations. If I say The Last Jedi is an objectively bad movie, and I provide a series of objective observations to back up that claim, well, how am I incorrect? It's not just my opinion. It's a series of objective facts, of evidence. It's a series of flaws, flaws that occur on multiple levels, which outweigh the good, like the music, the sound, and whatever positive world whatever world building this is. But you have boring taste and I don't want to be friends with you. The proponents of this idea will assert that the objective critic is only speaking about the tangible facts of the matter. I don't know how others do it, but I start with the observable and see if it makes any sense. If the plot follows logic, if the events follow lore, all these things. In a very large way, they mostly do not. They also have a lot of filler or useless scenes as well as poor pacing, which is expected of Star Wars movies. Now, every scene, and I mean every scene, not just some, of The Last Jedi is flawed on some level. Then we, we laugh or we rage hysterically on how horrible it is, and in no way do we deny any of our emotional reactions. We just do not start or end with them. We do not interpret them. We just say, this is god-awful, and then we list reasons how. While so-called subjective critics only talk about their feelings. But this is a false binary. It's totally possible to speak entirely emotionlessly about the themes of a particular work. Much the same way it's entirely possible to rage emotionally about the objective problems of a piece of work. For instance, I could say that the original Star Wars film is about why nature is superior to technology. And I can argue technology is superior to nature because A, a Star Destroyer can blow up a planet, and it does. B, all technology comes from nature anyway, so tech is just a newer, better, more durable, and more controllable version of nature, and it is. C, magical nature powers called the Force are only useful when combined with technology, apparently. The proton torpedoes did the actual deed. The Force just assisted when all the torpedo needed was a better targeting computer. D. Targeting computers can be upgraded. E. Magical Force powers are a poor plot device, etc, etc. You see, I can do this crap too, and just on a random opinion, a non-sequitur series of opinions, which has nothing to do with objective observations or objective critique. Just stop wasting our time, right? 
and I could point to the climax where Luke puts away the targeting system and embraces the Force, and that doing so helps him defeat the technologically superior Empire. Nowhere in that analysis have my emotions factored in, but I haven't described an objective quality of the film either. I've used evidence from the text to support a position, and in the process I've revealed something about my subjective perspective. Congratulations, you've showed us subjective interpretation is a pile of crap. But someone else could say the scene isn't really about nature versus technology, it's about atheism versus religion. The rebels won because Luke had faith, while the Empire lost because they belittled religion. Well, yada yada fucking yawn. We've come to two slightly different readings of the same film, and neither of them is objective. Then why did you bring them up? If you're going to attack objective analysis, show examples. Use examples. Use the same technique we use, and then critique us. That's all you have to do, buddy. They are steeped in the perspectives of whoever believes them to be true. And both of our hypothetical critics here could use their analysis as a reason to claim that the movie is well made. And they'd be wrong, because they'd be biased. Your straw men are literally talking about themes and saying that this movie is good because of them. I don't know if you're paying attention to objective critics out there or the objective method of observation and conclusions, but we, or at least I, certainly don't care too much about themes all too much. In fact, you're the one who cares about themes, which we both know are subjective interpretations based on your own biases. Please do not try to apply your subjectivity and claim it for this argument. And they would be speaking just as subjectively as someone claiming it is well made because the plot makes logical sense. They are opinions based on evidence that are held up to a personal standard. How is, how is a logical plot the same as interpreting a theme and saying because I like the theme of nature versus technology and it's expressed a certain way, how is that any, how do you compare those two things? Where did you make, maybe if you showed me an example of a logical plot and then compared, you know, the apple to orange, then I, I might at least know what the hell you're talking about. But you don't even do that. You're just saying logic is subjective. But this lands us in a bit of a pickle that is a sticking point for a lot of people. If all value judgments are subjective, then how do we know what's true? Doesn't that make everyone's opinion equally valid? I mean, why can't we just agree on a standard of quality and then judge everything against that? Wouldn't that be objective? Yes, that's what objective critics do. This is why we tend to agree most of the time on the basics. Now, we're not perfect because no one really is, and the criteria we use is variable, because it's not in every literary aspect as applicable to every piece of work, but we try very hard to be as accurate as possible. We certainly disagree on the details, and that's what's beautiful about literary criticism when using objective observations. The intelligent people have something to say. They have a point to make, and they have arguments. They have examples, they have evidence. The unintelligent, who don't have evidence, are, are in their own little worlds, are lost in these interpretive worlds of, of meaning and themes and whatever. And instead of getting into a, a dialectic versus rhetoric argument on quality and bore myself and everyone else and rereading the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the, the objective critic determines the form and composition of a piece of work and judges that objectively. They accept it as is. We say, okay, we're going to see a space opera. And then we use our experience of other pieces of work in the same genre. If there are flaws, we point them out. It's really no different than what happens during, let's say, an Olympic figure skating judgment. Um, you know, there's a technical dance routine, uh, a skater might fall or perform a jump incorrectly. You know, no matter how dazzling, creative, or stylish, or high, or how well timed with the music it was, or how much the, the audience cheers, or or how good and perfect their second jump is, or how perfect the rest of their performance is, that was a flaw. It still counts as a flaw. Deductions are made from this perfect score. Now, again, it's hard to say what's good. That's, that's subjective a lot of times. But everyone can agree, mostly, of what sucks. So how do we know it sucks? Well, I look at as many literary elements as possible and see how they're done properly. So the first one is, 
Is the premise flawed, or is it not the focus of the work? Is the plot flawed? Is the plot not properly realized or improperly rendered on the page or the screen? Are there inconsistencies in the lore? Are there useless elements I call fluff, and that could be anything? Uh, is there improper characterization and improper character development or any character development? Are there improper details to make us believe in the work? Is it improperly paced? Is it too slow? Is it too fast? And of course, is there improper structure? Is there poor or blatant use of literary devices like plot devices or patterns or archetypes? Uh, how contrived are some elements? How are they presented on the screen? That sort of thing. Now, there's various other literary things we look at that have noticeable qualities. Now, you see in writing, there are lots of things to consider based on the media, based on the genre, based on style. Movies aren't just avant-garde interpretive art pieces, especially when dealing with certain serious works of drama. A simple understanding of creative writing and literature will give you insight into pretty much all of these qualities in a piece of work. It was as objectively true to say that a rose is red as to say that it is beautiful. Citation needed. For Hume, you need a perceiver to exist for beauty to exist. But of course, this creates the problem we're running into. If everything is subjective, then how can we make any truth claim about a piece of art? By having objective conclusions, starting with objective observations. Hume's answer is in the title, taste. Basically, people can improve their taste over time and make well-founded judgments that we can trust. Strong sense united to delicate sentiment, improved by practice, perfected by comparison, and cleared of all prejudice can alone entitle critics to this valuable character. And the joint verdict of such wherever they are to be found is the true standard of taste and beauty. So Hume's answer is, we can't know what's good for sure, but we can get pretty close by listening to an expert, and that anyone can become an expert with practice. It's also better if we listen to critics as a whole instead of just one person, because by joint verdict he means that critics tend to come to a consensus on great art over time. And here we have yet another argument for the benefits of objective critique. Thank you, just right. Hume was an empiricist. That is a hard, material, metaphysical, objective one. He believed in a posteriori data as the basis of knowledge. He believed in standards of taste. Strong sense, meaning fully functioning senses to perceive the world. United in delicate sentiment, meaning all agree on the finer sentiments of beauty, or in this case, storytelling techniques and how not to storytell. Improved by practice and perfected by comparison. That is, the critics compare their arguments and practice their sentiments and criteria by looking at other media and other arguments, and cleared of all prejudice, that is, starting from an objective perspective and using objective observations, can alone entitle critics to this valuable character and the joint verdict of such, wherever they are to be found, is the true standard of taste and beauty. Thus Hume believes in a human sentiment on beauty through multiple critical eyes and arguments that over time we will come to this standard in art, which we have. People who make objective statements have their criteria criticized constantly, and we listen to the critics who have the best arguments, the best evidence, and the best understandings. In passage number 25 of the Standards of Taste, where these doubts occur, men can do no more than in other disputable questions which are submitted to the understanding. They must produce the best arguments that their invention suggests to them. They must acknowledge a true and decisive standard to exist somewhere, to wit, real existence and matter of fact, and they must have indulgence to such as differ from them in their appeals to the standard. It is sufficient for our present purpose if we have proved that the taste of all individuals is not upon an equal footing, and that some men in general, however difficult to be particularly pitched upon, will be acknowledged by universal sentiment to have a preference above others. Some of us have better sense. Some of us are younger and think quicker. Some of us have better brains. Some of us have better eyes and ears. Some of us see more evidence, more arguments, better ideas, and some of us are open to argument more and using any available tools to evaluate art. We simply like keeping our brains on when it comes to logic, using reason, finding evidence, and don't particularly like it when authors deliberately insult us. Tell me, just right, considering your lack of belief in objective conclusions, what standard of history do you think you're on right now? 
Basically, since great pieces of writing tend to withstand the test of time, the fact that they have been well regarded by so many critics in so many times and places functions like an objective standard, making it uncontroversial to say that Hamlet is an excellent play, for instance. It's sort of like polling data. So you agree with David Hume. So you can judge art objectively. Okay then, case closed. Things that are tied up in the idiosyncrasies of our senses can never be anything more than simply agreeable. You may find the color purple agreeable, I prefer blue. And there is no conversation that we can really have there. What is the idiosyncrasy of our senses? Our senses just pick up data, they are input organs. Our sense of taste, vision, sound, and smell work, or they don't. It's our perceptions and our standard of taste, not sense of taste, which is subjective. As for colors, sure, we can certainly talk about why certain colors do or don't work, even by themselves. This is called fine art, or design class. They literally argue about colors and hues and fonts and shapes and gradations and God knows what else. I'm not joking. Our senses just like different stuff. What the hell are you talking about? But the beautiful is different. When we see something beautiful, we actually feel that we have a good reason to believe that everyone should see it the same way as us. We actually believe it to be a true quality of the object, even though it isn't. So aside from semantics and how Kant perceives and understands the beautiful and his approach being very different, it seems he agrees with Hume's common sentiments of mankind, or sensus communis, or common sense, that there is indeed a standard of taste. This phenomenon is what Kant calls, and bear with me through all of these terms, subjective universality. <sighs> yeah, that is, that is a big weird phrase. So I know what you're thinking. This sounds like an oxymoron. How can something be universal if it is subjective? AKA objective. And I hear ya, but Kant is using this phrase to talk about the fact that while we can't irrefutably prove that we are right about something being beautiful, and philosophers from Plato's Socrates all the way up to Hegel, and perhaps beyond, would categorically disagree with Kant. What matters here is the fact that we feel like we have a good reason to believe that other people should agree with us. We have a justifiable opinion. You know when I have a justifiable opinion? I use objective observations, and I come to objective conclusions. I sometimes make a video about it. And I don't base this on my emotions or my perceptions of themes. I base it purely on my understanding of story, on my experience of stories, and thus the actual examples found in the work. Of course, I use logic, reason, and evidence. It's in this space that all conversations around art take place. So you're trying to tell me that all conversations about art occur within a space, within Kant's concept of subjective universality, which is your interpretation, is that we feel we have a good reason to get others to agree with our opinions of what is beautiful. Okay, uh, first, Hume and Kant's views are extremely similar. Kant is trying to be more rationally objective than Hume, while Hume based beauty on the idea of historical consensus. If anything, Kant believes in a priori objectivity more than Hume, who's the definitive a posteriori materialist. But Just Right would never admit to that because understanding Kant and Hume is really hard. It's actually contradictory that he added these two philosophers in here when their view of beauty or the aesthetic is very similar. Maybe he just Googled subjectivity and aesthetics and really liked what he read about Kant and thought, hey, there'd be no one out there who actually read both. Second, Kant wasn't perfect. He was certainly some kind of grammatic, semantic god, but that doesn't make for good arguments. In fact, wordsmithing is a really bad skill to have in philosophy, especially when Kant's trying to avoid disproving God in almost all of his examples, most especially the teleological argument. Kant believes that beauty is a subjective feeling, even though it seems to have a universal quality, which is contradictory. If it was innate, that would imply some kind of existence of God which would contradict his critique of pure reason. If beauty were some property in objects, then how did these objects acquire said property of beauty? And thirdly, no, not all art conversation deals with the space of what Kant referred to as subjective universality and the feelings we may get when we want others to agree with us. That, For example, my channel is based on rage and how horrible Just Right's videos are. You could argue I'm arguing on behalf of my perceived feeling, 
derived from subjective universality and my desire for others to agree with me in my feelings, but you'd be wrong because I said so. So to recap Kant's theory so far, taste is inherently subjective. However, to talk about the beauty of something, you can't be biased towards it. You cannot need it or see practical value in it. And the terminology of the agreeable lets us set aside totally abstract personal opinions from those we think should have universal validity. Congratulations, you just summarized Hume's view, but with different words. Who boy, that is a lot of stuff. Kant is literally the most difficult literary critic to figure out. I'm too tired to laugh and list dozens of examples of philosophers who are inherently more difficult to read and understand on the topic of poetics or the aesthetics. I don't think specifically literary criticism, so I'll just let this one slide. You're objectively wrong. But there is one more distinction to clear up, and it's between the beautiful and the good. And I think this one helps to explain the impossibility of objective critique. Oh, oh really? I, I seem to have missed that the first time through. What the devil have you been talking about all this time? What was all that about Hume in the beginning? According to Kant, in order for this idea of subjective universality to work, our minds must have what's called free play of the faculties for us to experience a pure judgment of taste, which implies no rules, literally a free method of thinking, which is something impossible because people are inherently limited and biased. But Kant also says we all inherently have this universal capability. In section nine, investigation of the question whether in the judgment of taste, the feeling of pleasure precedes or follows the judging of an object, which I won't read out, but what kind of saying here is in relation to beauty being pleasurable, at least, is a universal idea must have a point of reference and it must be objective. And we must all agree on this observation. If not, it's subjective and only based on one's person's state of mind and nothing more. And to be clear, this is only to the beautiful. That is the thing that pleases universally without a concept because Kant doesn't like referential statements too much. He's trying to figure things out ontologically and not about the good, which is about its moral goodness and non-moral goodness, right? Which would be a story. A story has a purpose. It can have a moral or non-moral goodness. Its purpose is to entertain and to teach. This is a very important distinction since Kant barely mentions art by example in section 14, elucidation by means of examples. In section 15, the judgment of taste is quite independent of the concept of perfection, which I won't read out again. To summarize, something with purpose and reference must be the good and is independent from the beautiful. The good has objective purposeness, while the beautiful has purposeness without purpose? I, I don't know. A book or a story is the good. It has a specific definite purpose. That purpose can be evaluated and judged throughout history as being more effective at its purpose to entertain by means of comedy, drama, catharsis, or whatever, and to teach a moral, an ethic, uh, a thing to admire or fear or something to strive for. This is why we have oral and written traditions. This is why we have media. This is why we have stories. I think Just Right got confused with seeing stories as purely pieces of art when they do have distinct functions, as all stories have distinct functions based on genre. Stories are not abstract art pieces, nor are they works of nature, even though they possess certain charms as the beautiful. As well, why the devil are we using Kant as a standard? or some gold standard for literary art critique. <laughs> and what the hell happened to Hume? Did Just Right just forget about him? He could have brought up Schopenhauer or Aristotle or any old philosopher and just forgot about them. And I certainly don't recall any of this crap in philosophy class or creative writing class in regards to art understanding. Kant barely even mentions art at all in the critique of judgment, in painting, sculpture, and in all the formative arts, in architecture and horticulture, so far as they are beautiful arts, the delineation is the essential thing. And here, it is not what gratifies in sensation, but what pleases by means of its form that is fundamental for taste. The colors which light up the sketch belong to the charm. They may indeed enliven the object for sensation, but they cannot make it worthy 
of contemplation and beautiful. Once again, art is thus a matter of taste and are not of the beautiful. In regards to motion, that is subjective feeling, does not belong at all to beauty. Additionally, sublimity, which, which the feeling of emotion is bound up, requires a different standard of judgment from that which is at the foundation of taste, and thus a pure judgment of taste has for its determining ground neither charm nor motion, in a word, no sensation as the material of the aesthetical judgment. What Kant's saying here is whatever motion we get requires a different standard for the foundation of taste, and pure subjective judgment must have zero emotion as the material from any aesthetical judgments you make. You can't use emotion to describe taste, meaning you can't say, I like X because it makes me feel Y, for a sense of taste. One must focus on a standard of the aesthetic which are not privy to emotion. Hmm, it sounds like Kant believes in an objective evaluation of things of taste. But let's see how there's the impossibility of objective critique from a philosopher who had nothing to say about literary art criticism and who actually believes in objective critique. I said earlier that things that are good have a specific purpose, and we can say objectively whether or not they are good at achieving that purpose. Like books and movies. A piece of art is a little different than nature though, since we are constantly debating what the purpose of a piece of art is. A painting or a film doesn't serve an obvious practical function. Yes, yes it does. For example, if a certain gentleman wanted a rip roar in good time, he'd want to see a movie like this. And that is exactly what I got. It's as if he knew the movie was going to have a certain function. Aristotle would say drama's purpose is catharsis. A horror movie purpose is for horror. A comedy is designed to make me laugh. Your videos are designed to make me hate humanity, especially when you try to shoehorn your anti-objective philosophy into some old white dead guy, which you barely read and didn't even understand. And even if the author creates it for a specific purpose, art tends to take on a life of its own and can fulfill many unforeseen functions. A painting or a film doesn't serve an obvious practical function, can fulfill many unforeseen functions. <laughs> And this is really important. If there's one idea I want you to take away from this video, it's this one. Because how can you establish the objective criteria for a piece of art when art doesn't serve a definitive, describable purpose? Yes, it does. A story has a purpose. Oral and written traditions are designed to be told and read. Their purpose is to entertain and teach. Apparently, to just write Kant's books don't serve a purpose, not even to back up his claims. There are rules of content and context for media and genre. Science fiction's got to have some science. Romance has got to have some romance. And feminism has to have a female ubermensch who can pull anything out of her ass because someone in power has a sexist ideology and a bad writer agrees with it. Like, you can say that a particular hammer is a good hammer because it is good at hammering nails. So I can't say a romance movie is any good if it depicts scenes and feelings of romance? Really? I, I can't say that? I guess we should just do away with genre at the movies and at bookstores entirely because they just don't serve a purpose. Since hammering nails is the purpose of a hammer. But with art, the perceiver has to invent the purpose of whatever they're looking at. While it's possible to buy a movie about hammers, how they're made and how you use them, and never actually use that knowledge for hammering and instead just buy a hammer and stare at it, uh, well, the hammer and the movie about hammers were designed for a reason, for a certain purpose. The same way a movie with action is there to entertain you through flashy action scenes. Your reaction to said action movie is subjective, sure, but the movie still serves a purpose. Whether it was effective or not is based on objective criteria for what is actually an effective action movie, and we do that through historical examples, as well as your subjective reaction to it, if it worked for you, for example. Is it to entertain, provoke thought, communicate a message, stir emotions, or nothing at all? With the purpose of stories, or its function, are to entertain and teach. 
Those are two very broad categories. I'm sure you could figure out the details. With every piece of media you encounter, those questions are up for debate. So if your criteria for a story is whether or not it has logical consistency, if that's the box you need checked to have a good time, that's fine. That's like saying a car, in my opinion, needs an axle for its wheels to turn. That's not up to debate. Logic is needed. A car needs functioning wheels to be a car. A romance movie needs functioning romance to be a romance movie. If it doesn't have functioning romance, we don't understand the character's reasons for falling in love, for example. Just like the car with no wheels, the movie doesn't go anywhere. A story needs sufficient details to grant the audience the willing suspension of disbelief regardless of its genre. What I'm arguing is that implicit in that belief are a lot of assumptions about what the purpose of a piece of art is. Yes, and you said art has no purpose aside from the beholder of the art. Newsflash, movies have a purpose. Books have a purpose. Stories have a purpose. Unless they're crap, then we can say why they're crap. What you derive from the stories, like the message or the theme, is interpretive. But to the objective observer, we can see and hear what is actually there, which may in fact be a literal message. With evidence, we can judge the form and function of the film or the book in detail or as a whole. It takes some time, but it's not really that hard. You just have to pay attention. You want to be smart? Don't read the Bible. Don't read the One Minute Manager. Don't read uh, How to Influence Friends and Make, uh, make People uh, you know, Kiss Your Ass. The, what you read is you read the Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes stories. You read the entire canon. They're not that many. You read the entire canon and you will be smarter than you ever need to be because every one of them is based on the idea of deductive logic. Keep your eyes open and be alert. That's what all good writing says. Wake up and pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. That's all it is. That's what good writing is. While you may not be scared of, let's say, the Blair Witch Project movie because of your mental temperament toward the fear response, but the majority of humanity, or at least the majority of those who saw the film, are very sensitive to the primal feeling of terror. For instance, you may believe that movies are primarily about escapism, and so anything that takes you out of the narrative is an enormous flaw. Stories are and can be many things. They're a form of escapism, they're a power fantasy, they're... They could be an idealized reality, they could be cathartic, but only if those elements are present in the actual instance of a story. For example, a drama by design, at least to Aristotle, is to perform catharsis, that's the point. That might not even happen to you, and there may be various reasons for that. But we must only look to the historical audience on that story to see whether it's effective or not. And then we compare with others, with repetition, as Hume has explained to us, in order to get an accurate professional account. And as for stories breaking your willing suspension of disbelief, unless they're comedies, farces, or real-life accounts or documentaries, all stories have and need the willing suspension of disbelief. Actually, especially comedies, where the fourth wall is broken constantly on stage or in movies. There's just nothing that makes that belief any more correct or incorrect than any other assumption about what art should be. But just right. We're not talking about art in general. We're talking about writing, fiction, books, Shakespeare, movies. If you don't have the willing suspension of disbelief, whatever you're watching becomes pointless, becomes boring, farcical. Exhibit Z. Ever seen a poorly put together stage play? I mean, I have. I've I recall watching high school people perform Romeo and, and Juliet in Italian to a primarily English audience. Uh, I was actually part of the production. I was one of the actors. It was unintentionally hilarious. We didn't have a proper willing suspension of belief on every level. Extremely bad set design, acting, dancing, music, lighting, line delivery, costumes. Hell, even the Italian words weren't pronounced properly. It was... It was ridiculous. What you just said was akin to saying a car doesn't really need tires to be a car. The willing suspension of disbelief is a composite relationship to a story. If you take it out, you don't have a story. So 
Whenever we critique the quality of art, we first make an arbitrary assumption about what its purpose is, then we invent criteria to decide whether that purpose is achieved, and it's only after that that the analysis proceeds logically. Okay, even if that's true, how is it wrong? Hume, as you have shown us, uses the historical account of art as being an accurate assessment. And that's how we do analysis. We look at token type relationships. We, we read more books. We watch more movies in the same genre. We compare them all. We use logic just because it's very effective. How is any of this bad? How is any of this subjective? This seems pretty referential and objective to me. In the first scene, the rebels use these big bombers against the First Order, and they get destroyed really quickly because they are big and slow. But, aha, you've been watching Star Wars your whole life, and you know that there's another kind of ship called a Y-Wing, which is also supposed to drop bombs. So why aren't the good guys using that ship, since it's smaller and faster and would survive longer? That would make more logical sense, checkmate, Ryan Johnson. Okay, now it's totally fine to dislike any scene in this film, but let's talk about why this is not an objective criticism. Not only do I know it is, I already know how you're going to screw up your own explanation. It's just, it's beautifully obvious. It's partly because most people do not know what a Y-Wing is, and even fewer know what its military purpose is, so to even make this critique, you have to have a certain knowledge of the lore. So you're saying if I have a certain knowledge of the lore, I can make this objective conclusion. Well, I do. And guess what? The movie didn't address this problem. Ryan Johnson didn't address this problem. He literally invented another ship, all for one visual scene, and didn't even bother to address the technology in a sci-fi flick. Firstly, that's insulting to the intelligence of the audience. Any writer coming into a franchise must be aware of its lore. If they aren't, categorically, he's a bad writer. He didn't do his homework. Now, let's say Ryan Johnson did know about Y-Wings and A-Wings and all that stuff. All he had to do was in the movie say, or have someone say, all our Y-Wings and B-Wings are out of commission. Done. Don't want to go that far? Great. Here's another option. These are the only bombing ships we have available. We're desperate. Done. See? It accounts for a problem the story from lore brought up naturally. Because the audience knew of other ships. I think the military commanders of the rebels would have knowledge of of how to fight. They just would. However, that's just the ships. That's not how the ships are flying, their speed, etc. It doesn't explain why the bombers don't have missiles, why they're dropping in space somehow, why the Star Wars wiki or website or whatever had to explain this nonsense after the movie came out, and they got the explanation wrong. You know what's great about certain bombers in history, like, I don't know, the, the, uh, the stealth bomber, the B-2 Spirit? They're really fast. They have great damage potential for ground targets via missiles, and they're undetectable by radar. The bombers in The Last Jedi, despite being spaceships, have none of these qualities. Why is this a bad scene? Because the writer-director really wanted a World War II reference. That's all. And he didn't have the skill to do so. He literally rammed this scene into the Star Wars world without caring about lore, without properly setting it up. It is an objectively bad scene on multiple levels. Form follows function. These ships and their, their design, their bombing design, does not follow the appropriate function. They have zero shields and get shot up instantly. Instead of launching missiles, they have to drop bombs in space. In order to do so, they have to slowly move over to the giant dreadnought, and their payload can be is so destructive. It just one of them, I don't even know if it's all the bombs or half the bombs or or even one bomb, completely obliterates the dreadnought. One of these ships could have done that. Why do they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bombs then? It makes very little sense. So it's not just that the lore and its continuity and its reference or lack thereof was bad. That's not just insulting the audience and their knowledge of the lore. This is a horrible scene based on strategy, tactics, and ship design, and of course weapon design. 
These are all factually based opinions. But on top of that, you have to believe that adhering to the lore established in other films is more important than the immediate impact of the scene. If you want to maintain the willing suspension of disbelief, you need a believable universe. Star Wars is a franchise. It has lore. If you disregard the lore, you are chipping away at the believability of the universe that is Star Wars. And that is done in this scene, in this movie. And that's just one instance of The Last Jedi screwing up lore, all because Ryan Johnson wanted to put a World War II bomber scene in space and didn't know how to do it. The fact that the bombers are big and slow is a nonverbal way of communicating an idea to the audience. Yeah, that they're so comically designed for this mission, because no explanation was given. Why are we using slow, big, flying bombers in space when we know their design was purposely based off World War II bombers to hit ground targets from the air? This is the equivalent of a tank, without armor, going into battle, really slowly, so you can eventually get up to some enemy troops and then deploy some sort of chainsaws and, and cut through them all. It looks ridiculous. And your interpretation is not only subjective, but goes to show how out of touch of common sense you are. Or as Kant would say, sensus communis. It justifies in our mind why the ships are destroyed so easily. So because they're big and slow, it justifies their destruction. What if they were small and fast and still got destroyed because of their lack of shields? The only thing it justifies is these are really stupid tactics with the wrong equipment. That the rebels are using the wrong tool for the job. Even if Poe is able to knock out all the defense towers, that doesn't take into account the potentially hundreds if not thousands of TIE fighters from other ships that will pick apart these things off like the, the large, slow-moving targets they are. In fact, their destruction is so obvious. It exists, I think, so we can have a contrived scene of Miss Tico here desperately trying to drop the bombs in space because, after all, she's the only one left. Because, of course, these bombers have a mobile detonator for some reason and she drops it. Oh, It's contrivance piled on contrivance for forced melodrama. It's pathetic. It's obvious. And anyone who doesn't see that is blind or a moron. And anyone trying to justify this crap makes them sound like some sort of deluded insane person. Whichever side of the argument you land on, it's simply a personal preference, and it's based on a bunch of beliefs about which aspects of a story are more important than others. The willing suspension of disbelief is the most important aspect of every fictitious story. This bombing scene blows anyone with half a brain out of the water. And that's not even the worst scene in the movie. Even though none of them are inherently more important than the rest. Artists are constantly faced with these kinds of trade-offs, where they can choose to sacrifice the logic of a scene to a degree in order to improve other qualities of the film. Just Right is categorically wrong. Nothing, zero, needed to be sacrificed if Ryan Johnson really, really wanted his World War II bomber scene in space. Nothing. But because Ryan Johnson can't write well, didn't pay attention to lore, and thus did not have enough details to explain the scene, this is the crap we got. Now, if you were in the shoes of the great Marsha Lucas, the editor on the original Star Wars, two versions of the film stand before you. The whole thing has already been shot. There is no third solution, so you have to choose. Do you and Georgie release the cut that has tension or the one that's more logical? There is not an objective answer to this question. First off, logic is not a quantity. Something is either logical or it isn't. Something is not more logical than something else. Like computers are pure logic, they even fail on proper fail states, logically. It doesn't matter if your syllogism is, or your if statements uh, have one line or, or thousands. It's either logical or it isn't. Secondly, editors, for the most part, make stories better. The title of the video in question is How Star Wars Was Saved in the Edit. There is an objective answer to this question, really. We simply have to compare the two versions of the movie. Which one follows lore? Which one hits all the space opera criteria? Which one has better pacing, better plot progression, better characterization, better character development? Which has less fluff? 
etc. We can do this. There's techniques to do this. There is an objective method and criteria for making better stories. This is what editors do. It seems as if Just Right isn't aware of the purpose of editors. And yes, sometimes editors make mistakes, give bad advice, they tell writers to rewrite stuff or just don't care about certain aspects of work. But they are the ones, hopefully, who know what good writing is, who have final say on a piece of work because they understand their clientele best. This may all just seem like a semantic grievance to insist that the terminology of objectivity versus subjectivity is wrong here. But I think it's more important than that. Implicit in the terms is a hierarchy. The idea that objectivity is better than subjectivity. Yes, it's more useful. It has actual standards. It's also therefore closer to the truth. Therefore, it's better than any other school of thought when it comes to literary critique. You're making objective conclusions starting from objective observations. And that we have to agree on what something is objectively first before we can even get into subjectivity. While it's possible Kant would want Mr. Free Play of the Faculties, he was referring to the beautiful and not the good. Movies like Star Wars are not abstract art pieces or naturally occurring beauty things. They have a certain function for a certain moviegoer. They are of the good, apparently. Again, Kant is being generic. He is not referring to stories, which is kind of like me referencing Aristotle's Categoria in the Organon to talk about books, when I really should be looking at his poetics. It would be disingenuous of me. And again, Kant is not the potential gold standard for literary criticism. I really don't know why Just Right is bothering to go through something he barely read and barely understood. The terms empower those who want to end discussion rather than those who want to encourage it. Well, I use objective conclusions from objective observations, so this is me making a video trying to get discussion going. Come at me, bro. I will happily destroy you and your ridiculous opinion that objective critiques don't exist. Okay, so up until this point, I've been arguing about why it's impossible to say whether a piece of art is objectively good or bad. And you failed miserably. First, you brought up two philosophers, one you completely ignored, which disproved you, and a second who's actually even more objective if you paid attention, that you barely understood and even got the meaning of beauty wrong, which if you paid attention also disproved you. You then tried to ham fist into a form of literary critique when the second philosopher was only really talking about perception of the beauty. They imply this is how all art criticism exists, or discussions exist, without addressing any concepts in literary criticism. Then you brought up The Last Jedi and said the bombing scene is just fine regardless of the audience's lack of lore because the ships are slow and big and therefore we can understand why they get destroyed. This is your argument so far. And if you want more on this, I recommend checking out Jack Saint's video. <laughs> and I want to make the case for why, in my opinion, other kinds of criticisms are, from my perspective, just plain better. Implicit in the terms is a hierarchy. The idea that objectivity is better than subjectivity. Finally, we come to an actual argument. Now, a lot of great smart people have already talked about this too. I recommend checking out Patrick H. Willems' video on it, as well as Film Crit Hulk. To say Patrick Willems is a great smart person is to be a comedian. To waste our time talking about Hume for no reason, and then not read and then misunderstand Kant, makes you an idiot. This is fine, as those two guys are hard to understand, but it doesn't help in trying to make a point. But hey, Just Right is going to give us a point, some kind of argument, any, any time, whereupon logical criticism of art is inferior to subjective something. I, I don't know, let's find what he's gonna say. Essay. The point I wanna make about plot holes is this. They are usually not the real reason people didn't enjoy a movie. Citation needed. There are almost always deeper and more personal issues with a film that prevented people from connecting with it. So you're saying I have other means of identifying with the film, aside from its plot. Okay, how does that contradict the importance of plot? Or lessens its holes? How is this other method of identification better or stronger than the plot? A plot is, after all, by E.M. Forrester's definition, the motivation of the character. So... Why wouldn't I use plot to identify with characters like the protagonist and thus the rest of the film? But now, Just Right is saying it's the whole movie. 
How am I to identify with the whole movie if not by the plots? That is the protagonist's reason and motivation for existing and doing anything in the story. Which aren't as easy to identify or articulate as plot holes are. But plot holes are very easy to explain, and since you didn't like the movie, and the plot hole is a problem in the movie, it's very easy to fall into the trap of saying you didn't like the movie because of the plot hole. Saying you don't like a movie because of a plot hole isn't a trap, that's an objective observation, an opinion derived from it. One of my favorite movies has plot holes. The difference is, they don't have very big plot holes. They're very minor. And I know the movie is not about that aspect or the element of that consideration for a whole. Nor is it a serious blow to the believability of the world and its characters. The story is still logically consistent despite having plot holes. Not every plot hole is made the same. And I believe this because there are a bunch of movies with a ton of plot holes that pretty much everyone really likes. Remember what I said about The Dark Knight a million years ago when this video started? It has more plot holes than any movie you can name. While some plot holes are intentional, like alternate universes or unreliable narrators, each plot hole is different in scope and magnitude. I believe Just Right is referring to The Dark Knight Rises and not The Dark Knight. Now, it's not that The Dark Knight Rises is a bad movie, it just pales in comparison to what came before it and does have some bad and numerous holes in it. As with stories, it's how the scenes are executed which make it good storytelling and how holes are lampshaded. Now, I'm not going to go through all the errors in the movie, but you can enjoy a bad movie regardless of its objective flaws. Don't believe me? Watch The Dark Knight Rises' What Went Wrong Wisecrack edition. The Joker's plan makes no logical sense in virtually every scene he's involved in. Oh, so he is talking about the Dark Knight. I guess he didn't count the number of holes in the Dark Knight Rises then. <laughs> As for Joker, he's a madman. Like Kefka from Final Fantasy VI, we give him some leeway, but he's crazy. Madmen just kind of have that crazy plan thing going for them. They don't care for logic too much. In fact, every character so long as they follow their character, are being logically consistent, even if they themselves are chaotic. You could literally talk for hours about the logic in this movie not adding up. And yet, people still love the film because it has incredible pacing, great acting, compelling characters, intense action, interesting, provocative, and relevant themes, and gives the viewer the vicarious sense of being Batman, along with a hundred other reasons. None of which disprove the holes in the story which simply means there's more good than bad, or the good is more compelling than the bad. There's more to keep the people watching the film to see what happens next. You can call it sensationalism, you can call that having enough hooks to keep you entertained, whatever. But to say it doesn't matter is a fallacy and categorically wrong which all successfully distract you from its logical failings. To put it simply, there are some terrible films where the logic holds up and some excellent films where it doesn't. While this is his own definition of a term excellent film, in this example, the good simply outweighs the bad. These kinds of art or experiences exist. Now, this is not to say that the logic of a story never matters. Of course it does. Literally every choice in the artistic development of a story matters. And it's totally fine to have an appreciation for films that get the logic right. But what I'm saying is that to make a better case against a film, it's important to demonstrate why the presence of a plot hole impacts other aspects of the storytelling. If you notice a plot hole in one movie and not in The Dark Knight, it's because The Dark Knight has better pacing. Uh, no, I highly doubt pacing is the main reason we didn't notice the plot plot holes, or we don't notice plot holes, or that the plot holes aren't that large, or that we can forgive Joker for being a madman because madmen have their own ideologies outside of logic and reason, and we didn't have time to think about that. Pacing is the motion in relation to scenes, to get from A to B, and good pacing is where there's little flat as possible or fluff between the scenes. Now that might garner our attention with more sensational scenes, and thus we forget or turn our brains off from what came before. Those scenes still existed. That's like saying a, an action space opera is just fine because everything happens so quickly, you don't have time to think. And if you do actually think about it, then you're watching movies wrong, you stupid smart person. You're trying to use your brain too much, which is completely absurd. So why does all of this matter? Wait, weren't you supposed to make an argument for how logical criticism of art is inferior to subjective criticism? Did I, I'm still waiting for it. 
Did I, did I miss it, or have you not made it yet? Why am I so committed to the idea that this kind of criticism should occupy a smaller fraction of film discussions? Three reasons. First, since my channel is dedicated to writing and is meant to be useful to writers, I find it hard to believe just right if he can't even read philosophy, let alone understand what he could read of Kant, let alone use some cockamamie idea for an argument he hasn't even made yet. But sure, he'll teach us how to write gooder and then sell us something on Skillshare, like how to write because he's so good at teaching us writing. And yet he's trying to sell us on how objective observations and conclusions are bad in literary or movie criticism. And logic is bad. Yeah, let's just turn off our left hemisphere, folks. That'll make you a better writer. I'm sure you don't need that when you write at all. Don't listen to Harlan Ellison, one of the greatest writers of our time, who tells us to go read Sherlock Holmes. So you can actually be smart by learning deductive logic? Sure, let's listen to this guy because Hume and Kant said things that he can't even understand. I think it's especially important for writers to embrace other forms of criticism. Analyzing the content of media, the ideas it's communicating, and not just the form, is the best way to improve your own writing. You know the best way to be a good writer? Read, write, listen to criticism, even from the bad ones, and get an editor. Is this, is this Harlan Ellison? Yeah, what do you want? Oh, shit. Um, my name is Joe Struzinski. I'm a writer, and my stuff isn't selling, and could you, maybe you had some advice. Which is the stupidest thing to ask any writer, because there is no good answer to that question. It's like the question, what are you doing with my life? There is no good answer to that question. And he says, your stuff isn't selling? I said, no, it's not. All right, here's what you do. Stop writing shit. If it wasn't shit, it would sell somewhere. My advice to you, stop writing shit. Everyone argues on what is good, but everyone knows what sucks. Except these people. You want to know what sucks? Ask someone who makes objective conclusions. If you treat stories purely as logic puzzles to be solved, I think you are only setting yourself up to produce superficial pieces of art. Well, there goes the entire murder mystery genre, or mystery in general, and suspense, and foreshadowing, and symbolism, and having large overarching plot lines that connect to previous works, or any potential plot twist. I mean, who would ever recommend only making a story based on logic? Who is recommending this? Do you honestly think that's how people write? Do you honestly think people like me are recommending to budding young authors what to do? People write because they've got this big frickin' ego and they want their name to have some value after they die. Does Just Write honestly think that writers want to hear some critic just sing their praises? No, they want to hear and know what's wrong with their work so they can improve because they know they can be better. Not listening to your critics who happen to use objective criticism is just a bad idea. For that matter, listen to all your critics who use, I don't know, <laughs> Marxist or feminist literary analysis. They'll at least give you a good laugh. You have to read deeply to write deeply. Well, that's rich coming from the guy who barely read human Kant and barely understood them both and didn't even have an argument to make after the fact and just neglected Hume halfway through. Second, because the quality of art and the quality of criticism are interrelated. Tis hard to say if greater want of skill appear in writing or in judging ill, but of the two, less dangerous is the offense to tire our patience than mislead our sense. Those lines are the opening words of Alexander Pope's An Essay on Criticism, published in 1711. And in them, he makes the case that bad criticism does more harm than bad writing. Uh, since I don't know the context, I automatically disagree, but okay. Considering you don't use objective observation, then yes, you are bad at literary criticism just right. And you're trying to tell us, without an actual cogent argument with points that I don't know where from Kant they came, why we shouldn't use objective criticism. Since bad criticism will influence more writers in the wrong direction than a bad story would. Really? So you're saying a really popular piece of work, I don't know, like a blockbuster movie, let's say Transformers, will influence people less than the critic criticizing the Transformers movie. 
Okay, sure. That that's how that's how Hollywood works. They don't <laughs> spend all this money on the movie. They should be spending it on the critic, apparently. <laughs> For Pope, criticism creates the grounds from which great art springs. And so if we want better art, we need better criticism. Is this a thing or is he just bullshitting us? I mean, I've been inspired by my own thoughts, my own motivations, my appreciation of art to make other art, to write other stories, sure. But I have never been inspired to make art from someone else's critical eye of an existing piece of art. I mean, it's... I've never read a critic and go, gee, I, I could do better. Let me go do that. That's never happened to me. I get that feeling from actual art, not from someone else. Maybe this happens to others. I mean, it'll be purely anecdotal. Is this how Hollywood works? They're just like sitting on the on their expensive terrace and they start opening the paper, you know, back in the day. And <laughs> there's a critic in the paper and he's like, oh, Casablanca was shit. Uh... And then that person who reads is like, oh, I can do a better job than Casablanca. And then they make the next cantina scene in a, a new space opera franchise. Is, is this is this how it goes? <laughs> I'm quite sure people are influenced by art more so than the critic of the art. Just maybe. Just maybe. Right? Film discussions that are too focused on logical inconsistencies will lead to art that is too focused on logical inconsistencies. They're supposed to be. Imagine how much better movies like the Nolan trilogy would have been if they were logically consistent and solid. They would be shining gems on every standard and criteria you could throw at it. And it would have taken, I don't know, a few tweaks by some editors before production even started to make it as such. A little bit of editing goes a long, long way. That's like saying the tires of a car can all be octagons, so long as you get to where you're going. So long as you have a, a rip-roaring good time at the expense of story, character, and theme. Story. The entire body of work will somehow not be made because a writer is too scared to be logically consistent. When has this ever happened to a writer or a future writer? <laughs> because they're scared of what a critic would say about their logically consistent narrative. <laughs> I mean, it's the whole work. My writer's block is because I'm scared of a critic's logic. Logic is greater. What? What is going? <laughs> oh, and logic is also greater than than writing a character. And, and writing theme? Like, what? <laughs> I think at this point, Just Right has lost the whole flow. I mean, obviously he doesn't like logic, so he obviously was not paying attention to his argument, trying to make sense, trying to have points, and, you know, the essay style is long gone. So I don't know what the point is. He could have used any terms here. It's just pointless crap. I mean, yeah, logic really hurts characters. And the, the theme, yeah, just, just that only, it's only going to hurt the theme. Sure, you, you can't focus on theme or characters now that you've just focused on logic. I mean, you, you can't. You, there's not enough time in the day. I mean, you only live one life. You, you can only write logically consistent and then you're done. That's it. I don't want future artists to decide, actually, I won't write this story since it doesn't make perfect logical sense. I mean, who wants to live in the universe where the Wachowski sisters don't make the Matrix because their idea didn't adhere to the law of thermodynamics? Our culture would be immeasurably poorer for it. Who the hell is saying this? Who is scared of critics? What is going on? Are critics putting guns to people's heads? And for the love of Kant's categorical imperative, do you know what an editor's job is, sir? I recommend you Google it. Take the Coles Notes version, ask some guy in the street. Just, just figure that role out, okay? Lastly, for both writers and non-writers. So, everyone? You know, just right, logic doesn't have to be your enemy here. I think this conversation matters because media analysis can, for lack of a better phrase, nourish the soul. It helps you make sense of the world. Often, when we see a piece of art, we are confused by it. Just so you know, literary criticism, or movie criticism, or analysis, we're not talking about abstract film pieces. There are rules for writing certain kinds of stories. 
there are rules for producing certain kinds of films. Just Right keeps talking about art as if it's some bizarre, abstract thing, but we all know it isn't. That's not what movies and books are. Confounded by it, it's only through the act of creating and absorbing criticism that we can bring sense to that experience. Yes, criticism of art is the search for meaning. Literary criticism is exactly that. There is meaning to be found in works of literature. But guess what? If you want to be accurate in your criticism, you got to use objective observations. You can't just go down some garden path because you like the colors there in your head. If you want to make stuff up and talk about themes and feelings, go ahead, go crazy. I'm sure someone out there will read what you're writing, but it won't make a lick of sense. And bring the insights of that process into our everyday life. The kind of criticism I think you should seek out or produce is one that seeks to understand what is being communicated in a piece of art. Yes, and what's being communicated sometimes has holes. That's how it goes. Nothing is perfect. If you don't see these holes, you're either blind, you weren't paying attention, or you're biased. Why would a critic want to lie to their audience? Because if you're not using objective observations, you are automatically lying to your audience. Just stop lying to your audience, right? A criticism that puts those messages into context, one that demonstrates how art affects us both personally and socially. Nah, we don't really care about your personal experience. You're a nobody. We all are. Just as you, as you have stated, your reactions are subjective and thus interpretive. Stop wasting our time and get to the truth. And that shares a unique perspective that can make something beautiful even more so. Criticism can do so much more than say whether something is good or bad. And I want to do more to show you what criticism can be. That's why this episode is the first in a new mini-series on this channel that I'll be calling The History of Arguments. You, just right, are horribly equipped to talk about art or literary criticism or movies or whatever the hell that was all about with Hume and Kant to even begin to talk about it. And now you're going to have a series. You still haven't even made an argument. You have no points. Considering your disdain for logic and how you're trying to have an argument, or I guess the attempt at an argument, without using logic, I don't know. <laughs> but if you're not using logic, I'm seeing no appeal to emotion, and I'm not seeing any appeals to authorities, so... <laughs> What's the point of this video? Oh wow, it's Skillshare. Who saw that coming? A rip-roaring good time. 